نحمد و نسلی على رسول النبی الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الرحمن الرحیم مالک یوم الدین ایاک نعبد و ایاک نستعین احنا السراط المستقیم سراط الذین انعمد علیهم غیر المغضوب علیهم ولد شان حبیبی ان اللہ و ملائکتہو یسلون علی النبی یا ایوہ الذین آمنوا سلو علیہ وسلم و تسلیما اللہم سلو علی سیدنا و لان محمد و لعال سلو علی سیدنا و لان محمد مبارک سلو علی سلو علیہ سلاتم و سلام علیکی یا سیدی یا رسول اللہ صلو اللہ علیہ وسلم امم You know, as I said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everybody. Uh, you know, I'm continuing to have troubles with the format, as some of you probably noticed. You know, I just looking into the camera, you, uh, for me, it's kind of like a sense I'm like, you know, I'm getting drawn in, and it's like, don't go toward the light, for those who understand that reference. Uh, but, uh, you know, inshallah, I'll keep trying to learn, and I guess I have to make myself somewhat delusional. So I feel like I'm having a conversation with the camera. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, just Allah make it easy for me, inshallah, and for everybody to understand what I'm trying to say uh, as well, inshallah. Uh, last time we were talking about the connection between the sacrifice of Ismail and uh, you know Ibrahim and and the sacrifice of Imam Hussein uh, But before I go into that again, because I need to kind of complete that properly. Uh, that was part of the point where you know I was trying to get drawn into the lens and everything just goes out of my mind. Uh, you know, of course, you know, lockdown will be lifting somewhat, uh, but you know, everything from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is good, uh, and so for the believer, everything is good, uh, and because the believer takes the opportunity uh, or takes and doesn't let anything go to waste, so you learn from it. Uh, and this is an opportunity for us to learn uh, it's many things that we should have already been doing at home, uh, you know, and how to do them. Uh, even salat, you know, if you can't go to the masjid, you know, we need to ma be making salat in the house in jamaat. Uh, normally, I would say, you know, the head of the house, you know, lead the salat, but I would just say the 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 man of the house should lead the salat, and uh, you know, of course, children behind him and the women behind them. Uh, but uh, you know we should be doing this uh, and even in times when it's not a lockdown you know if you can't go to the masjid uh, or you know if there are other circumstances then we need to be doing this anyway including tarawih you know, so so you know just and also learning you know because right now there's everybody's on the internet uh, and uh, you know but you know we shouldn't leave that opportunity just because lockdown is gone but uh, or whatever sense of lockdown we have here uh, but coming back to the sacrifice of Ismail al -Islam, you know as I mentioned last time uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Sa'fa Surah number 37 uh, وفد... وف... وفدينا عليه في الآخرين. you know he says that he ransomed or he replaced you know the sacrifice of uh, uh, Ismail al -Islam, with this great sacrifice and he postponed this for a late for later generations uh, so again at that moment he was replaced with the ram from Jannah whose horns were actually kept inside of the Kaaba until uh, Yazid attacked Mecca and burned the Kaaba and, and those horns were burned at that time uh, but the uh, but it was still a ram and a ram compared to Ismail al Islam, you can't say that this was a greater sacrifice. Because it was not. You know, Allah subhanahu wa says, Dibhin Adim, you know, this great, he, he ransomed him with a great sacrifice. And he postponed this for later generations. Well, you know, generations through time have been sacrificing animals. But again, you know, it's not similar or equal to, you know, sacrificing, you know, like Ismail al Islam. And so this is reference to. Imam Hussain al-Islam. 
you know, because the sacrifice of Imam Hussein al-Islam in the field of Karbala it was in reality the sacrifice of Rasulullah s.a.w. himself. You know, the blood spilt in the field of Karbala wasn't, was in reality the blood spilt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The army that came against Imam Hussein al-Islam in reality came against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, so for those who, who claim that uh, you know, Imam Hussein al-Islam was mistaken in not giving allegiance to Yazid, you know, that attack isn't on Imam Hussein al-Islam, the attack is in reality on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, because Rasulullah sallam said, al husaynu minni wa ana min al husayn that, that Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. You know, so the character, the honor, uh, you know, the reality of Imam Hussein al-Islam is the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so, this is something we need to understand and remember because we need to keep in mind, as I said before, this connection between the household of Ibrahim al-Islam and the household of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, and this is the only way we can understand these verses, uh, you know, because this is that connection. And if we look in the Qur'an, you know, I was alluding to Surah Baqarah, and this is where my mind went blank. Uh, you know, in Surah Baqarah, you know, it's actually verse number 155. But if you start before that, you know, three verses before that, Allah SWT says, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرُكُمْ وَشْكُرُونِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونِ That, um, you know, remember me and I will remember you and be thankful and do not do uh, kufr, do not do this or do not be among the disbelievers. You know? So Allah SWT equates ungratefulness with disbelief. Uh, and so being ungrateful to Allah SWT is in reality disbelief. You know? And so in every condition the believer is grateful to Allah SWT. He is thankful and grateful uh, and he remembers his Lord in every condition. You know, whether outwardly it appears something strange or something bad, but for the believer again everything is good. Because he's always connected with Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, and then he starts off, "Ya yuhladina amanu sta'ayinu bil sabri wa salah." Inna Allah ma'asabirin. That oh you who believe, addressing the believers directly, oh you who believe, seek help. You know, through patience and salat. You know, and basically, patience and salat are a wasila for you to seek help from Allah. So if patience and salat are wasila then the one who is the embodiment of patience, the one who is the one who brought us salat and who, whose emulation is salat, you know, how is he not a wasila? He is the wasila. Rasulullah Sallallahu is the greatest wasila uh, for our connection to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so, inna Allah ma'asabirin, you know, verily or without a doubt, Allah is with those who are patient. And this is important to remember here, uh, this patience aspect or aspect of patience here. And then he says, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتُلُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ بَلْ أَحْيَاهُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Do not say about those who are slain in the way of Allah that they are dead. So what do I say? He tells us, immediately he tells us what to say. He says, بَلْ أَحْيَاهُ That they are alive. وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْرُونَ But it's beyond your perception, beyond your comprehension. Their life is greater than what you can comprehend. Yeah. And so for, a, for, for so the believers never say about, the, about those who are slain in the way of Allah that they are dead. Because Allah says they are alive. Period. Just we don't understand. But the next verse. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوِ وَنَقْسِمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And we shall surely try you with something of fear, hunger, loss of your wealth, loss of your life, and your offspring. So we will try you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and loss of life, of your life, and the loss of your offspring. وَبَشِّرِ sabirin And glad tidings to those who are patient. So if you look at this verse with the conjunction of and, which means all five of these things have to be true, have to be complete, 
in order for the statement to be true. And the only place in history that we find this you know, is in the field of Karbala. Again, this is the sacrifice of Rasulullah where all of these members of his family have been sacrificed. You know, if you look at you know, the condition that these people went in, and I'm not going to go into the details of that right now because you know, that gets into a totally, well, not a totally different subject, but, but, but kind of gets in, into other areas. Uh, I'm going to come back to Ibrahim al-Islam, but when we look at this, this is, you know, this, this, this is the only place where this verse fits completely where you have all five of these aspects being tested and tried at one time. Yeah. Because if you look, you know, even through the Qur'an with other sacrifices, you know, you have, you have fear and you have loss of wealth, or you have loss of life, of the self, of, and, and fear, or loss of wealth, but you don't have all five of these all coming together all at the same time. You know. So this is a very important aspect to remember from this, you know, from this sacrifice of Ibrahim al -Islam and, Is and Ismail al -Islam, connecting that with the sacrifice of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Imam Hussein al -Islam. Uh, The, you know, I mentioned after this sacrifice, we talked a little bit about Ishaq al -Islam and the birth of Ishaq al -Islam. I'm not going to go back to that right now. Because, you know, even though chronologically that's what happens, you know, the birth of Ishaq al-Islam comes between the sacrifice of Ismail al-Islam uh, and the rebuilding of, of the Kaaba uh, or the raising of the foundations of the Kaaba. Uh, but, uh, you know, because Ismail is, or Ishaq al-Islam is roughly about 11 or 13 years younger than Ismail al-Islam. Uh, and that's also an important point to, to understand because at the time of the order of the sacrifice of Ismail, Al -Islam, you, you know, Ismail al Islam is the only child of Ibrahim al Islam, which makes this an even greater sacrifice. Uh, but, uh, like I said, I'm going to come back to that and kind of tie that in with, with the situation with uh, Lut al Islam's people a little later on, inshallah. Uh, but continuing from here, you know, again, Ibrahim al Islam is making trips back and forth. You know, so after he, the sacrifice, he goes back to Canaan. Uh, and then eventually he comes back to visit his wife and, ch and child and, and as Ismail Islam of course is growing older uh, you know among the people of Jurram and, and then the order comes you know from Allah Subhanahu to rebuild the Kaaba yeah. and so the two of them start this project uh, and uh, you know the foundations again are already there and Allah Subhanahu mentioned in the Quran that they've raised the foundations so they're, they're building this up. The Kaaba at the time of Ibrahim al-Islam is not the same as it is today. In that when Ibrahim al-Islam, when he builds this, you have two doors to the Kaaba. One where it is today, but it's at ground floor. Uh, and uh, you have another door at Rukne, on the side of Rukni Yamani. So you would enter from one door and you exit the other door. The place where the Hatim is, that was actually inside of the Kaaba. So all of this was in the Kaaba. So the Kaaba wasn't the cube that it is today, but you have the structure going uh, over into the Hatim as well. So almost a rectangular shaped uh, structure. And it was not as, as high as it is today. And we'll talk about when and, and the ch why those changes were made later on, inshallah, because those changes were actually made during the time of Rasulullah so some before the declaration of prophethood. Uh, but we'll talk about, you know, what brought that on, uh, inshallah. Uh, but I'll give you a hint, uh, Quraysh ran out of lawful funds uh, when they were rebuilding the Kaaba. And again, this is before the declaration of prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But, uh, you know, the order comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Ibrahim al-Islam to do this. Uh, so Ibrahim al-Islam along with Ismail al-Islam, they, they start this. And so Ibrahim al-Islam would lay the, 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 the stones and, and the bricks and, and, and everything where it was supposed to be. Ismail al-Islam would bring everything, the mortar and everything, and, and hand it off to his father, who would put it in its place. And then it got to a level where the wall was tall enough where Ibrahim al-Islam couldn't reach easily. So for this, Ismail al-Islam brought a large stone and he placed it there so his father could stand on it. Uh, and he would hand off the stones and then his father would put them. The interesting about the stone, which the stone today is known as Maqam Ibrahim. This is where we make Turaqat Salat after we make Tawaf uh, today. 
Of course, maqam means status, and the maqam of Ibrahim al-Islam, of course, is not the stone, uh, but is you know it, it reminds of, of of his status, which is you know complete reliance on Allah subhanahu wa taala. So, but wherever Ibrahim al-Islam needed to go, the stone would automatically move in that direction. You know, so wherever he was going to put a stone, this the stone that he was standing on would move, uh, and he would place the stones in this way. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so, so something touching the foot uh, of, of a Nabi also knows what's in the heart of that Nabi. You know, the other, another miracle of the prophets that, uh, uh, is that, you know, if they place their foot on the hardest of stones, you know, if they want to, then that stone will give way and their print will remain there. And yet, if they place their foot on the soft, soft, softest of sand, you know, and they don't want to leave a mark, there will be no mark there. Uh, and so, you know, maqam, the, this stone still has the footprint of Ibrahim salam on it. Even today, you know, even though they've lined it with the silver lining these days, but it's still there. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so they, they build the Kaaba in this manner. You know, and then when they complete this, this task, you know, after they're done with the, with the, with the building of the Kaaba, uh, Ibrahim al-Islam and Ismail al-Islam, both of them, they know the purpose of this. Uh, and they understand the purpose of what they're doing, which is why they make a dua. You know, and the dua is in Surah Baqarah, verse 129, where they ask their Lord, A'udhu Billah min Shaitan al-Rajim, ربنا وبث فيهم رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياتك ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة ويزكيهم إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم. They say, O oh our Lord, send amongst them a messenger. But they say رسولاً, which in in you know because of the تنوين means not just any messenger, but this high elevated you know honored messenger. Messenger of the messenger, send him, you know, you know amongst them, you know, who will uh, recite to them your your ayat, your verses, mm -hmm. and the, the the order here is very important. He says that he they will he will recite to them the verses, and he will what uh, teach them the book and the wisdom, and he will sanctify them or purify them. But then in the end they say, إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ You know, verily you are uh, great in wisdom. You know, so this is the dua we're asking, but you accept it the way you want to. You know? So they know that the purpose, you know, is to build a platform for the coming of Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is what they ask. You know? And we'll get to the answer in, in a minute. The other thing that happens at this time also is that Allah subhanahu wa orders Ibrahim al-Islam to make a call. You know, call all of creation or all of mankind and jinn kind to, for the Hajj. So Ibrahim al-Islam, you know, he's in the middle of the desert. I mean, not a lot of people there. I mean, who's going to listen to him? So he asks Allah subhanahu he says, Ya Allah, you know, I'm going to make this call, but who's going to hear it? So Allah SWT tells him that you make the call and I will re relay that call. And so Ibrahim al-Islam makes a call, calling the people for Hajj. Mm -hmm. And all of mankind and jinn kind, those who are, there, who are already born there and those who are on earth, and those who are still not yet born, heard the call. Mm -hmm. And those who said Labbaik to the call will go for Hajj. And some people said labbaik twice and they will go for two hajj. And others said it three times and they'll go for three hajj. So however many times they respond to that call, that's how many times Allah SWT will allow them to come for hajj. Shaitan, however, you know, when he saw this, he says to Allah SWT, where is my share in this? And this is the point a lot of people forget. He says, where is my share in this? You know, because when he promised Allah or when he vowed, that he would mislead the progeny of Adam al Islam, and Allah SWT gave him respite until the end. You know, you do that, but those who he said to what to him? He said, Those who are mine, you have no authority over them. 
So if we don't want shaitan to affect us, then we need to become, you know, Allah's. You know, we need to do, uh, submit ourselves to Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when shaitan makes the call, Allah SWT says, well, you make a call as well. So he also makes a call. And Allah SWT relays that call to everyone as well. And everyone who heard his call, who responded to his call, also go for the Hajj. You know? But these are the people that go and they pick the pockets. And they go with every other intention except for the Hajj. You know? And they do everything that they shouldn't be doing on the Hajj. Or they may be pious in appearance, but their hearts are, 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 are diseased. You know, like the narration in Mustadrak uh, of Imam Hakim, which is a say hadith where he says, where Rasulullah talks about a man who is fasting and making salat at Maqam Ibrahim, and he dies in the condition of sajda. And Rasulullah says, and he enters, enters hell directly. Why? Because he has animosity against Sayyidina Ali, karam Allah you know, Animosity against the household of Rasulullah you know, and So that is his end. You know, so these are the people that respond to this call. You know, and Rasulullah also said about the Hajj, he said a time will come when the leaders will come for show, the rich will come for vacation, the middle class will come for, for business, and the poor will come to beg. And if you go, you know, on Hajj these days, this is what we see. You know, they've created, they've made Mina into an open flea market. You know, so may Allah SWT protect us from this. You know, and allow us to respond to this call of Ibrahim al-Islam for the Hajj and make it, you know, with the pure intention, you know, solely for Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just like, you know, in the famous hadith, which is the first hadith in Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith, where he says, إِنَّمَ الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ That actions are by, but by intention. What does Rasulullah say after that? He says that those who, in, who made hijrah, for, for Allah and His Messenger, made hijrah for Allah and His Messenger. So the intention is for Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when Ibrahim al -Islam, you know, makes this dua, you know, that oh Allah send amongst them, and Ismail al -Islam, oh our Lord, send amongst them a messenger you know, from themselves who will recite your verses to them. One, teach them the book and the wisdom. You know, or teach them the book and teach them the wisdom, two and three. And then on the last he says, uh, sanctify them or purify them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to this dua. In Surah Nisa, verse number, or Surah number three, verse number 164. Uh, where he says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَإِنْ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ and without a doubt for surety, Allah has con conveyed a great favor. Man is a favor above all favors. You know, it's like where favors end. This is it, the favor of favors. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Upon the believers. Not just to everybody. Even though Rasulullah is a favor to all of creation. But, you know, the only ones who will benefit in the end are the ones who accept Him. You know, so عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْهُمْ That he has sent amongst them this great messenger. And the common translation is from amongst themselves, you know, which is okay. But if you truly start you know, trying to go into deeper levels of understanding, you know, it literally means uh, uh, that he has sent this messenger the way life comes to you. There, he is their life. He is the life of the believers. And then what does he say? He, he says that he says he, he rehearses 
or re recites the ayat or the verses to them. Number one. And then he says, and he purifies them. So number two is purification. And then he teaches them the book and teaches them the wisdom. So the dua was, recite the verses, teach them the book and the wisdom, and then purify them. The acceptance is, recite the verses, you know, bring them into Islam, and then purify them next, and then teach them the book and the wisdom. And there's a lot of significance to this change here. You know, because also, I mean, if you think about it, Ibrahim al-Islam says, إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ That you are great in wisdom, so you accept it as, as you see fit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw fit to change the order. Because, you know, and our teacher, uh, Shaykh uh, Muhammad Yusuf Sulaimani, he gave the example, he said, you know, it's like you take a clay, clay bowl. Of course, the heart, you know, we are made from clay. So as you take a clay bowl, and then, you know, you put uh, 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 podina, the... Uh, uh, like um, mint in it, you know, and you rub it in there real good. And then, you know, even when you take the mint out and you wash it out, now even if you put milk in it or you put anything in it, you know, that, that essence of the milk, I mean, of the mint is always there. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have filth in the heart, Even if you put the book and the wisdom in there, all you've done is you've made the book and the wisdom, you've, you've, you've taken that knowledge of the book and the wisdom and just made it filthy. You know, you take a pure glass of, of, of water, you know, and nobody has a problem drinking it. You know, you add a drop of, of urine to that pure purity and now it's, the whole glass is impure. Same way you take a glass of urine, you can add as much pure water to it, it doesn't matter. So the first duty is to purify or cleanse, to sanctify the heart. And then if you learn the book and the wisdom, then it benefits you. Otherwise you become like you know, those people who use the book and the wisdom simply to, for their own worldly benefits. You know, and there's no shortage of people like this. You know. And the Quran talks about people like this. Uh, you know, and they've been there from before and they will continue to be there. The only difference is now their numbers keep increasing. You know, so, so if we want to learn the Qur'an and we want to learn the wisdom, then the, the prerequisite to that, you know, if we want to learn it properly, is the love of Allah and His Messenger. And how can you love somebody you don't even know? So that's the whole purpose of all of this, is to learn uh, about, about them, so we know them, so our hearts are inclined towards them, because we realize that there is no life without them. You know, there is no life without the mercy of Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent His Habib وسلم, as that mercy. Yeah. Yeah, and and Rasulullah what did he say? He said, teach your children three things. And the first thing he said to teach them was Hubbi Nabiyaka, the love of your Prophet. And then he said Hubbi Ahle Bayti, the love of his family. And then he said Tilawatul Quran, the recitation of the Quran. You know, he didn't say teach them the Quran first and then try to teach them the love. You know, he said teach them the love first. And then when you teach them the Quran, it becomes very easy and it comes right to the heart. Whereas today we try to do the opposite. You know, we want to force the book on them, you know, without explaining or without them understanding who this book was sent to and who is really the explanation of this book other than Rasulullah Wasallam. He is the book, he is the explanation to the book, period. You know. So we need to understand this. And again, you know, when we look at the fam when we look at the household uh, of Ibrahim al-Islam, again, that's pointing us toward the household of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the dua that he made, and the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted this dua, I mean, you know, the change there is very significant. You know, this isn't a minor point. Yeah. And this is the basis for what we see in the Ummah today. You know, for all of this, pro all the problems we see within the Ummah. 
You know, we have so many Hafaz and so many scholars and everybody else is, you know, either Alim or Alima or this or that, or Ustad or whatever other titles they take. You know, Mufti Azim of this and this and that. But if the foundation is being poured into a heart that's not pure, or rather if the foundation which is the heart, you know, all of this knowledge is poured into that, which is already filthy to begin with, I mean, what do we expect to come out of that? You know, it's like they say, you know, you are what you eat. You know, same thing for our souls. If we're feeding our souls, you know, if our soul is already diseased and we're trying to, we're trying to give it some knowledge without cleaning it or, or, or curing it first, and the cure is the love of Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the love, you know, according to Mulana Rumi, who is a great scholar. He's not just a poet, he's a great scholar. You know, we'll talk about him at some point, inshallah. Uh, you know, he said, you know, that anyone who finds fault in his beloved, finds a weakness or, or a shortcoming within his beloved, is a liar in his claim of love. You know, so if I'm going to say that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, didn't know this, or he didn't have authority over this, or this or that, I mean, you know, then, uh, you know, because he is khayr khalqullah, he's the best of creation in every aspect, physical, mental, spiritual, uh, even aspects I can't even comprehend. He is the best in everything. Because Allah SWT has created him that way. Yeah. You know, even Hassan bin Thabit, in Hadith al-Taqriri, which was, he said in front of Rasulullah so what did he say? Yeah. He said, uh, min kulli aybin, that you are created without any faults, you know, without any shortcomings. So, this is the aqidah of the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. So this is, you know, basically, you know, we're talking today about this, uh, you know, the building of the Kaaba. And so after the Kaaba is built, they made this dua. Uh, and again, you know, they understood that they're, be, they, they're building this Kaaba for the platform of Rasulullah You know, another important point to, to understand here, which I'm going to end with today, inshallah. And then, you know, next time I'll come back to the story of Ishaq al Or touch upon that. Uh, is that, you know, of course, our Kaaba or our Qibla today is the Kaaba built by Ibrahim salam and Ismail salam. But people don't understand why it's the Qibla. You know, Allah SWT says in the Quran that, that it doesn't matter to him whether you pray toward the east or the west. But then why did he make this our Qibla? And before this, the Qibla was Masjid al-Aqsa. Yeah. So why the change? And a lot of people think, oh, see, because, you know, Ibrahim al-Islam built this and we are on the religion of Ibrahim al-Islam and so this is why, you know, this is, uh, this is our Qibla, which is not the case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an why he made this change. You know, from Masjid al-Aqsa to the Kaaba. You know, and it's Surah Baqarah again, verse number 144. You know, but before that, you know, this verse was revealed in the second year of Hijri. We have to understand, you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu was making Salat from the beginning. Yeah. But in Makkah, he would make Salat in such a way that he would be standing on the side of Rukn Yamani, facing Jerusalem, facing Masjid Al-Aqsa, but the Kaaba would be in between. And this is how he always did it. Then when the order came for Hijrah and he emigrates from Makkah to Medina Munawwara, well, now when he's facing Masjid al-Aqsa, you know, the Kaaba is in the other direction. In the second year of Hijri, you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu is making Dhuhr Salat, leading Dhuhr Salat in Masjid Qiblatain, you know, which is you know, in Medina Munawwara, Masjid of two Qiblas. And he's leading the Salat. He has companions behind him. In the second rakat of that salat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a verse, which is probably the only verse that it was revealed in the condition of salat. And Rasulullah sallallahu is constantly looking up, you know, towards the heavens, waiting for the verses to come. 
You know, for us, the order is to look down. And even those scholars who say that it's okay, you know, looking around doesn't break your, your salat, uh, if you read the hadith that they narrate, uh, by uh, Ka'ab bin Malik, uh, uh, radiallahu anhu, who is he looking at in his salat? He's looking at Rasulullah sallallahu in his salat. You know, so we'll come back to this point later, inshallah. But Rasulullah sallallahu is looking up. Looking up, looking down, looking up, looking down. And Allah Subhanahu reveals the verse. قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ That, oh my beloved, I see you, I see your beautiful face looking up toward the heavens. قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهَكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَا نُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا And soon we will change your qibla to whatever pleases you, my beloved. Yeah. He didn't say we'll change your qibla to the Kaaba. He says we will change your qibla to whatever pleases you. Yeah. So our qibla isn't the Kaaba because Ibrahim al Islam built it. Allah SWT says that our qibla is the Kaaba because this is what pleased Rasulullah. You know, if Rasulullah was pleased with something else being the Qibla, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have made that the Qibla. The only reason the Kaaba is the Qibla is because the Rasulullah is what, you know, wanted this to be this way. It was the desire and the pleasure of Rasulullah that made, that made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala change the Qibla. Nothing else. And this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. You know, in Surah Wadduha, what does he say? You know, he says that soon I will give you so much that you will be pleased with me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need to please anybody. You know, Allah is Allah, but this is the love he has for his Habib. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wala sawfa yu'tika rabbuka fataruda. You know, that I will give you so much that you will be pleased with me. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah. He doesn't need to please anybody. Especially his creation. And everything other than him is his creation. He doesn't need to please anything or anyone. You know, but the love he has for Rasulullah says, he says, you know, that I will give you so much, I will please you. So the pleasure of Allah lies in the pleasure of Rasulullah. So if we want Allah to be pleased with us, we need to make sure that we make Rasulullah pleased with us. But the interesting part about this, this verse here, you know, where it starts off with قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبُ وَجْهَكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَا نُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قَبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا You know, that soon we will change this qibla for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even wait. You know, our shaykh said that, you know, uh, he says, I don't know what expression changed on the face of Rasulullah so when he said soon. You know, it's going to be a future. In the future, I will make this change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling Rasulullah, I will make this change in the future. Then he says what? He says immediately, you know, after he says, قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلَّبَ وَجْهَكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَا نُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا فَوَلِّ وَجْهَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ That turn your face to Masjid Haram. Immediately. In the middle of Salat. And this is when Rasulullah in the middle of Salat takes a 180 degree turn you know, towards, towards the Kaaba. And the companions, most of them, you know, they're in shock what's going on. Ten of them turned immediately with Rasulullah You know, they say their beloved has turned, so they also turned. And those ten became Ashra and Mubashra, those who were given the glad tidings of, of Jannah in this world. You know, the ten greatest of the companions. You know, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to end here. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to gain a glimpse into the status of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa ala Muhammad wa ala ala salli ala Sayyidina wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa Allah guide us through the straight path and make it easy for us to do those things which please you and stay away from those things which displease you and fill our hearts with your love and the love of your beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and all those whom you love. 
those those believers who are being oppressed throughout the world and anyone who's being oppressed throughout the world, Ya Allah, help them, uh, especially our brothers and sisters in Palestine and Kashmir and, and Burma and every place else that they are being oppressed uh, and allow us, uh, allow our hearts to feel the, their pain and sympathy so that we can become part one with the, with the body of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, and Allah uh, allow us to be raised up in a condition where you and your messenger Sallallahu are pleased with, with us and we are pleased with you. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayru khalqihi Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in bi